So Mendelian inheritance and then extending this to the use of probability. A Punnett square on its own is considered semi-quantitative. You, you're not really <coughs> able to put too much quantitative information behind it. You get your ratios and that's about it. But we can use probability and probability theory to begin to add another layer of information to genetics and to our crosses. Just to give you an example here, let's say that we're doing a heterozygote cross for some gene that we're going to call G with uh, alleles, capital G. So if you run through and do the traditional Punnett square, you end up with a 3 to 1 ratio or a 1 to 2 to 1 genotype ratio. So phenotypically, you're going to have your three dominant individuals for every in, uh, single recessive. So ratio, one quantity that we can pull out of this, is expected to be three to one. Whoops. Three to one. But I can actually look at each of these individual alleles and I can quantify them. And I can say in an individual that has two alleles, so we're talking about dihybrid, uh, I'm sorry, um, uh, individuals with two sets of chromosomes, uh, chromosome from mom and a chromosome from dad. I'm going to be able to say the probability of receiving this individual gamete would be one over two. I have two options, and this is one of the options. So it's one half for both of these, and then one half for each of these. That's supposed to be a two, not a three. So what am I saying? I'm saying that if I have an individual that on their chromosomes, <coughs> they have a big G allele and a little g allele. <coughs> when we undergo meiosis and we generate our gametes, 50% of my gametes, or one half, should contain the big G, and 50% or one half should contain the little G. Is everybody following me? So the one half, one half, one half, and one half gets annotated in here to each of those particular elites. Now, this is where the probability, the power of probability comes in here. This individual here, I'm basically saying I have one half and one half. And if I take one half times one half, the probability of receiving this particular genotype here is one half times one half, which is one out of four. Because when we multiply those fractions, we're going to multiply two times two, bottom of the fraction. And I can do the same thing for all of these. So this would be another one half, one half, so one quarter, one quarter here, and one quarter here. Now, really pretty simple for a single monohybrid cross. But what if we go on to extend the probability and we make it more complex? The extension of probability now allows us to predict more complex problems. <coughs> so we're not talking about just a monohybrid cross, which is pretty easy to handle. We're not talking about a dihybrid cross, which is also pretty easy to handle. Now we're talking about four, five, six, seven traits all being considered <coughs> collective. What if all seven of those traits, we want to know, are they uh, polymendelian inheritance? How big would that point be? It would be huge. 
it would be totally cumbersome and really nearly impossible to do. But if we use probability, we can actually make this much more simple. And coupling this idea of probability now today to supercomputing, we can deal with massive amounts of information, entirely more complex problems than we've ever dealt with before. So in the sense of Mendelian inheritance, which is the idea that we have one gene with two different alleles, and each of those alleles would be equally likely to be passed off to the offspring. Mendelian inheritance can be likened to flipping a coin. Okay, so flipping a coin. What's the probability that I quarter, flip it, get a head? And what would be the probability that I get a tail? <laughs> so this idea of flipping a coin, the probabilities are going to have a range from 0 to 1, where 1 is certain. And zero is never going to occur. In other words, if I have a dice, a, a die, a die that only has one through six on it, what's the probability to roll seven? Zero. Never going to happen. What would be the probability to roll a one? I'm sorry, what was that? Yeah, one out of six. What if that die only had ones on it? Probability of one. Surf every time you roll. So a 0 0.5, which equates to a 50%, because we're using that number line of 0 to 1 to represent 0% to 100%. So 0.5 would equate to 50%. <laughs> In terms of flipping a coin, we have a 50% chance for heads or tails. If we apply that same <coughs> idea to a Mendelian trait, instead of it being heads or tails, it's the allele for the dominant or the allele for the recessive. All right, so let's go a little more complex. And we'll start again with the coin. So we both flipping a coin. Consider two successive coin tosses. So I flip the coin once, pick the quarter up again, and flip it again. Okay? This is equivalent in Mendelian genetics to successive fertilizations of a gamete. What we need to remember here, two flips of the coin, does the first flip influence the second? It does not. Does fertilization by one gamete influence fertilization by a second gamete? It does not. So both of these events are independent.
So because they are independent events, the rules that we need to follow in order to understand the equating of probabilities <coughs> will be slightly different. So we're going to have to use two rules of probability for these independent events that are going to be different than the rules that we would use if they were linked or if they were dependent events. So just to give you an example, make sure that everybody's on the same page. The lottery, how many of you stayed up late at night and you've seen the lotteries? Machines spin, they pull the lever and the ball pops up. The first number is a four. If they take the same ball out of each container, then these events are influenced by each other. Because the first ball comes out, and if there's, let's say, 10 balls in the container, and you take one ball out, what's the probability of any of those numbers? One through 10. One, 10. But then the second event, is influenced by the first event because you lost one of the balls. So it's no longer one out of ten, it's one out of nine. Whereas when you're flipping a coin, that coin doesn't change when you, you pick it up and flip it a second time. There's no magic. <laughs> it's going to rotate differently now because you've already flipped it once. Nothing like that. So we're going to use rules of probability that are specific for events that are considered independent rather than dependent. And the two rules, I'll give you the two rules and then I'm going to expand on them. The rule of multiplication and the rule of addition. So the rule of multiplication. We're going to use this to determine two independent events occurring in a determined combination. Okay, so we're going to use this rule of multiplication when we're going to try to determine if two dependent events are going to occur in a determined combination. So let me give you an example here. Okay, so what is the probability of rolling a six? So that's the that's the the event rolling a six, and then the determined combination two times in a row. So I take my six-sided die and I roll it. Get a six, roll it again. Get a six. What's the probability of that happening? So because it's determining the probability of an event occurring in a determined combination, rolling a six two times in a row, I'm going to use the rule of multiplication. So we should be expecting to see a multiplication. So start out and tell me what would be the probability of rolling a six on that first roll? One out of six. What's the probability of rolling the six on the second roll? What was that? One out of six. So here's the probability for my first roll. Here's the probability of my second roll. It's a predetermined combination. I'm using the rule of multiplication. I'm going to multiply the two together. So the probability of this happening is one out of 36. So what exactly does that mean? I got to sit down here and I got to be dedicated 
to roll the dice two times, 36 times. So I roll once, I roll twice, there's one. I roll once, I roll twice, there's two. I do that 36 times, I should expect that one of those times I'm going to roll two sixes in a row. All the other times I'll roll a one and a four. Two and a seven, but I'll roll two and a six. A seven. Oh my gosh, I did it. <laughs> so apply this to Mendelian genetics. What is the probability of two recessive gametes fertilized between R, R, and R, little r individuals, where the R, little r, is minor recessive. And it's called recessive. So what is the probability of two recessive gametes fertilized between these two heterozygote individuals? Okay? So the event is fertilization between the R, big R, little r individuals, my heterozygotes. And the predetermined combination is the probability of two recessive gametes in the gametes that fertilize. So how am I gonna how am I gonna handle this? So I have two independent events, right? What are my two independent events? What are the two independent events? It's not rocket science here. Everybody's thinking too hard or it's not easy enough. Get right in the middle. I've got to step, step back to the die. What were the two events in the dock? Rolling the dock, right? Rolling the die once, rolling the die twice. What are the events here? I'm sorry? I didn't hear you. Yeah, the event is going to be the fertilization of the two recessive, or of the recessive gametes. The, pro, the predetermined combination is it happens two times. So what's the probability that a recessive gamete fertilizes? Just on its own, what's the probability? From this individual right here. One half. What's the probability of a second recessive gamete fertilizing? One half. It's a predetermined combination, so I'm going to use the rule of multiplication. Put my multiplication sign in there. And that means the probability of this event happening is one quarter. Now, does that make sense? Well, let's go back and take a look here at our Punnett square. Here are my two individuals similar to these two individuals here. So what's the probability of two recessive gametes coming together to fertilize? One quarter, one out of four. Okay, so there's our first rule, rule of multiplication. Our second rule is this rule called rule of addition. Now the rule of addition is going to be applied to the probability of an event that can occur in two or more different ways. So we're going to use this rule of addition when the probability of an event 
can occur in two or more different ways. We're going to add the probabilities together. So what is the probability find this point flipping a head and a tail back to back? So I want you to consider that. And what does that actually say? What's the probability of flipping a head and a tail back to back? Really what it's saying is, what's the probability that I can flip and I get a head and then a tail? Or it could also mean I flip and I get a tail and then a head, because that would still be head and tail back to back. So in this particular example, we can flip a head, then a tail, or we can flip tail their head. Okay, so what's the probability of flipping a head? Okay, so one over two. And the probability to flip the tail? One over two. So the probability of flipping a head, then a tail. Notice, what is this? That's a predetermined order, right? What's the probability of flipping a head and then flipping a tail? So I would actually have to apply here the rule of multiplication. So a head, one half, then a tail, one half, Multiply together gives me one fourth. And then I can do the converse here, the other option. Flipping the tail, then the head. And so we got one half and one half. Multiply together gives me a one quarter. So each event on their own, or each option occurs in a predetermined fashion, and the result is one quarter. If I apply the rule of addition here, add together the one quarter and the one quarter, that's two quarters, or one half. So the probability to flip a head and a tail back to back with no predetermined order is going to be one half of one quarter plus the one quarter. Two individual events occurring on their own. This is as far as I'm really going to take it for this class. In genetics, you're going to do much more of this. If you take genetics here, you would get uh, exposed to a much larger sample set of problems on using probability. You look at <coughs> four individual traits. What's the probability of certain characteristics co uh, coincided together in the individual? For four individual characteristics traits, or five individual traits. Um, you're also going to apply this idea of probability to uh, a likelihood for you to pass on, let's say, a really bad gene. Maybe you're a parent. You don't know anything about your genetics other than some of your ancestors. 
and you can look through and say, okay, I know that my great grandma had hemophilia, and my wife's great great grandfather had hemophilia. What's the probability that we carry the hemophilia allele? I don't have hemophilia myself. What's the probability that I carry hemophilia? And what's the probability that my wife carries hemophilia? And what's the probability that we would cause our offspring or one of our offspring to have hemophilia? Is it one out of ten? Is it one out of ten thousand? So that you can see, you begin to see how we can extend this idea of probability so that the answers to very real questions in genetics using simple math rather than expensive genetic protocols. So that's as far as I'm really going to take it for you here. What I'd like to do now is to take a look at Mendel's principle, and I'd like to extend that. So Mendel did this himself. He actually looked at additional traits. So he went from flower color to p morphologies and the pod morphologies and the size and shape of the plant and looked at additional traits. And what he began to find out And what we've begun to extend as we look at additional traits for other organisms is that all of these characteristics that we're studying do not follow Mendel's principles. In other words, if I take an individual who's tall and breed them with an individual who is short, I don't get the 3 to 1 ratio that I would expect from my offspring. So even though the characteristics we have all the different phenotypes, all the different genetic characteristics. Have, even though they don't follow Mendel's principles, because in all reality, there are a lot of traits that are not defined just by one gene. Body height, the example I just gave in humans, is predicted to be associated with hundreds of genes. And so we can't simply use <coughs> Mendel's predictive capabilities to do a monohybrid cross between really tall individual or really short individual and say, oh yeah, we're going to get three that are really tall and one that's really short in the F2 generation. So even though Mendel's principles don't hold for all characteristics, the utility of the principles are still useful as a base for understanding more and more complex traits. One of the variability, areas of variability that occurs is in domination. And so there's some variation on dominance. Occasionally, we can have a trait that expresses a phenotype, that outward expression that's in between the parental phenotype. So over here, this example here, the F2 is what is shown here. The F1, we had purple and a white plant produced all purple, then we crossbred those, and the white reappears. So we don't have anything in between. We have the same color purple 
in these flowers as we did through all the other purples, the same color white that we see throughout all the other white plants involved in this cross. If the phenotype was in between, maybe it would be more like a lavender. It would be a lighter purple color, as if these two different alleles were mixing together. We can turn to another plant for some example. We can turn to a plant called snapdragons. Pretty interesting looking plant. There's an example of the snapdragon. When you bleed green snapdragons together, you take a true green red plant and a true green white plant, and the offspring in the F1 are pink, which is right in between the red and the white. So what's going on there? It's possible that maybe they're mixing the colors together or some other things going on. So we look at the flower color gene. And we still know that snapdragons are carriers of two chromosomes, two pairs, or pairs of chromosomes come in pairs. So we have the two alleles. And the two alleles are for red and for white. So in that F1 generation, homozygous dominant, we could indicate as being red, the head homozygous recessive, indicate as being white, and then our heterozygote is pink. So the F1, we end up with these pink flowers. And there's a variety of reasons that it could be pink. They could be mixing. So the white dilutes the red, or the red dilutes the white to turn it into pink. <coughs> it's possible that maybe we're producing less of the red pigment now. And so instead of being real vi vibrant red, we're more of a pink. When we breed out to the F2 generation, we now have a red, original color to the, one of the parents, and the white, original color to the other parent, and then that pinkish color that we had in the F1 generation. So it's probably not mixing. Because if it was mixing, just like if I were to take paint, if I were to take paint and put red and white on a palette, and take some of the red and some of the white, mix it together, I'd get pink. And if I took that red and that white and mix them together, you could get the pink. Can I ever get the red and the white back out? They're mixed together, so I'm, I'm kind of stuck with the red and the white being mixed together and not being able to get the pink back, or not being able to get the red and the white back out. But here, I'm getting the red and the white back out in the F2 generation. So we're obviously not mixing the alleles together. The pigments aren't mixing together. In other words, what that means is this would indicate that there is not a loss red pigment. Because if there was mixing, then we would think that we would lose our red pigment. And so in our pink individuals, we would end up with pink colors here. And maybe it would be 
even a different color of pink in the F2 generation. All right, so now consider the F2 generation. So in the F2 generation, you can see the result of the cross here. When I bring the snap ray and I get a ratio of one red to two pink to one to one white. One red to two pink to one white. So what we see is that the red and the white return and so therefore they weren't washed out, they weren't mixed out, they were retained. <laughs> Now, if you really look at it, you still have sort of a 3 to 1 ratio. But really, you have a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio. And in that 1 to 2 to 1 ratio, the explanation that fits best is that you have exhibition of incomplete dominance. In other words, one allele is not robust enough to create that really red pigment color. You need both alleles, both being red alleles for the red flower, whereas the white flower is the absence of that pigment. In the pink flower, you only have half as many of the red alleles present in this individual as you did in the original red individual. And so it's not producing as much pigment, and so rather than being red, it appears to be pink. And we call that characteristic incomplete dominance. If it was completely dominant, it wouldn't matter how many pigments were there, it would still appear to be the same color red in the F1 generation as we have in the parental generation. So the dominance, it's still there. There is still dominance there, but it's not complete dominance. Another example of incomplete dominance comes in this thing called blood types. How many of you know your blood type? There are actually a variety of different blood typing systems. You are probably most familiar with um, two different types of blood typing. The ABO system and then the row negative row positive system. Or RH, negative RH positive. Because a lot of you probably would tell me, oh, I'm leaning on A negative. Or you might be O negative or O positive. And that's a reference to the two different blood typing systems. You're either going to be A, B, or O from one system and positive and negative from the other system. A third system is the MN system, which you can see present here. Now, with blood typing, the, the red blood cell, it has that glycocalyx. Remember we talked about the glycocalyx probably two or three months ago? And you can actually tag certain proteins and, and, and glycoproteins on the surface of the red blood cell with a molecule that causes them to conjugate together. And we call that agglutination, and that's what's being represented here. So if I give this certain chemical called anti-N serum, if the N blood type is present, it causes all of those, uh, all of those red blood cells to clump together. If it's not present, then it doesn't cause it to clump together and they say it's individual red blood cells. So I can take a blood sample and I can drop on the anti-serum A uh, M or the anti-N serum. And if that particular 
blood type or blood marker is present, then it causes the red blood cells to clump together, and you can actually visually see that on the uh, test data. So when we do this for, <coughs> excuse me, when we do this for blood typing using the MN system, we can have three different types of cells. We can have the cell that has the M alleles, or we can have a cell that just has the N alleles. So if I take anti-serum M here on this cell, what's going to happen? Are we going to get agglutination or no agglutination? Anti-serum M. I have the M blood type. So I cause agglutination to occur. Over here, if I put on the anti-N serum, it causes agglutination. What if I do the anti-N anti here? No agglutination. What if I do anti-M here? No agglutination. The other option right here in the middle is to have an M and an N. Either anti-serum is going to cause agglutination. Which one of these alleles is present is defined based off the genetics that you have. So for individuals using the MN system, we use our alleles M, N, and MN as designators. And again, each of these designators is simply representing molecules that are present in the membrane of the blood cell. So we're going to represent a molecule in the membrane of a blood cell. And we can detect that molecule using these anti-serum. These are chemical tests. So we can detect those molecules, the presence of those molecules chemically using these things called anti-serum, these chemicals called anti-serum. And this is an example of phenotype. You know, I could phenotype all of you right now for hair color just simply by looking at your hair color. Or I could take a blood sample, I could put that blood sample on a petri dish, and I could drop on the anti-serum, and if I see the, uh, the agglutination of the coagulation, then I know what phenotype you have, or I can determine your phenotype. Based off of that phenotype, if an individual reacts to the M anti serum, then I know the M blood group is present. Same goes for N, if it reacts to N. The N group is present. And then in the case of MN, which would be my heterozygote, this system we end up with both groups being present. So what would it look like if this was a classic Mendelian trait. I take an individual that I have phenotypes as being MN and an individual that phenotypes as being NN. Only gametes that this guy can produce are the N gametes. Gametes the only produced here are the N. So in the F1 generation, M, M, N, N, I should expect MN 
N, 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 N. And then when I take each of these individuals and I treat them with the anti serum, if it follows classic Mendelian genetics, where I have one gene defined by two alleles, one of the alleles is dominant and one of the alleles is recessive, I should expect that all of these individuals would just have, if M was dominant, the M blood type. But what I would find out is they actually respond to both anti -serum. And so it doesn't follow classic genetics. And so I need an alternative system. When M and N are both present, I get both groups phenotyped out. And that means that both the M and the N for this particular blood type exhibit dominance. And so this MN blood system is co-dominant system. So I would expect co-dominance here. We'll go ahead and stop here. When we pick up on Wednesday, we'll talk about the effects of multiple alleles. In other words, what if we actually don't just have two alleles? What if one gene has three, four, five, six different alleles in a population?